John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. It is the fall of 1867 in New York City. After the Civil War, after the catastrophe that's darkened the nation, and there's a rebound underway, the man in the White House at this point is not material. His name is Johnson. However, the man in New York are very material. The rise of what becomes some of the biggest fortunes and most outrageous stories of our time, The Murder of Jim Fisk. For the Love of Josie Mansfield is a new book from H.W. Brands, the distinguished historian. And this is part of his American Portrait series. However, this story is impossible to believe, except for this sets the tone for the Gilded Age. Professor, a very good evening to you. In the fall of 1867, Jim Fisk goes to what is plain spoken, a brothel, a uh, madam's house on 34th Street, I believe, and he meets Josie Mansfield. Who is Jim Fisk, and who is Josie Mansfield the first time their eyes cross? Jim Fisk is a New Englander who found his way to Boston and then to New York during the Civil War. He was a peddler. He traveled from town to town, but he realized that there was greater money to be made in the financial markets of Wall Street. He arrived during the Civil War at a time when great fortunes were made in speculation. He fell in with some of the most famous, some of the most notorious, some of the most capable speculators, people like Daniel Drew, who had been in Wall Street from the time when Broadway in New York was a cattle trail that came from the hinterland all the way down to the lower reaches of Manhattan, which was all the farther up civilization had gone. And individuals who got into the speculative markets in those days could see the possibility of great fortunes. The boundary between the public sector, the private sector, between the legal and the illegal was very gray and misunderstood. Jim Fisk was a person who decided that this was his opportunity. He was a young man. He arrived in New York in his late 20s. And he saw that fortunes were being made. He thought that he should make just such a fortune. This is Jim Fisk, right. Josie Mansfield. Josie Mansfield was a young woman who called herself an actress in the days when an actress covered – the term actress covered all sorts of professions from actual stage actresses to street-walking prostitutes. And Josie was somewhere on that spectrum. It varied from time – and place to time and place. She had spent time on the West Coast. She had been married uh, in her teens to get out of an abusive stepfather relationship. She apparently had appeared on stage, but the marriage went bad, and she decided that she needed to get away from San Francisco and move to the East Coast. She started out in Philadelphia, but she heard from people in Philadelphia that there were greater opportunities for an attractive young woman who knew how to ingratiate herself to ambitious young men in New York. So she found her way to New York, and she found her way to this party at this brothel in the autumn of 1867. She spied Jim Fitt. She asked who this person was, and she introduced herself. And the relationship began. Now, Fisk dressed elaborately. He also wore, I presume, he liked diamonds. And he was colorful. He was married. He had a wife in Boston. He had what you'd have to say, he was self-educated. But he falls for Josie right away. She tells him she, he doesn't have enough money to pay her rent. Quickly, he has a house for her on 23rd Street, and she's his mistress. Now, that's all important. We've established this relationship, which is, which is comfortable. Because now... This is about the murder of Jim Fisk, and you now have heard the motive. There's only two motives. There's love and greed, and we've established that love. Now to the greed side. 1868, Jim Fisk's partners, his senior partners, are Jay Gould, and, of course, you've mentioned Daniel Drew, who is the spectacular and much older. Jan Daniel Drew at this point is, is close to 70 years old, if not 70. Yes. And they decide to take on Cornelius Vanderbilt and the, uh, the, Erie, the, the Erie Railroad, the New York and Harlem Railroad, the, ca the, the clash with Vanderbilt. Who was Cornelius Vanderbilt that they want to take on? Cornelius Vanderbilt was the wealthiest man in American history until that time. He was the wealthiest man in New York. He was known for ruthlessness, for his ability to take control of whatever business situation he found himself in. He started off in water transportation, in sailboats and then in steamboats, and then in railroads, so that by the late 1860s, he was the most formidable railroad owner, entrepreneur in the United States. He already controlled large sectors of the railroad, and he wanted the Erie Railroad. The Erie Railroad was the road that connected New York to Lake Erie, and this was going to add a key piece to his railroad empire. 
He knew that if he got it, he would be able to set prices throughout much of the eastern seaboard. Because rail, Daniel, railroads were their Internet. They, they were their high commerce. Yes. They were the Internet plus interstate highways right. plus right. modern airlines. Railroads were what held the country together and what promised a grand future for the American economy. So who controlled the railroads would control the fate of the American economy. And Vanderbilt knew this, but so did Dan Drew, so did Jay Gould, so did Jim Fisk, who realized that Vanderbilt could be enticed, forced, to pay a very high price for control of the Erie Railroad. In those days, the issue of new shares of stock was largely unregulated. Reporting was non-existent. And so Drew managed to get control of the Erie Board of Directors, by which means he was enabled to issue new shares of stock that nobody else knew about. And so when Vanderbilt was trying to buy more and more shares of stock on the assumption that there are only so many shares of stock out in there, if I, if I get these, I will have majority control, Drew and Fisk and Gould kept issuing more shares of stock. So the more Vanderbilt bought, the more they issued with the idea that they could get him to pay and pay and pay, and he still wouldn't have control of the railroad. The uh, clash is spectacular, and the professor tells it very quickly here because we're going to get back to the murder of Fisk. But what I learn is that all of New York watched this, all of the nation watched this with great fascination as Drew and Gould and Fisk and their colleagues uh, gather up stock and cash and flee across uh, the Hudson River to New Jersey because they know that the courts owned by Vanderbilt can't pursue them there for arrest. There's, uh, there much, there's much incident. There's a lot of what you'd have to say is... Uh, you know, spectacular Hollywood, hang, uh, you know, at the edge of your at the edge of your seat activity. But in the end, what it what is important here is that Fisk becomes extremely famous and extremely uh, uh, prosperous and extremely prominent as a man who represents this gang that took on Vanderbilt and wasn't crushed by it. Is that a fair summary? And, and that's it. Fisk was the front man for this cabal. Fisk was sort of the Gilded Age equivalent of Donald Trump, someone who was very well known, someone who was quite egregious, someone who was always in the public eye. He wasn't the sharpest speculator of the bunch. He didn't have the deepest pockets, but he was the one everyone knew about because Fisk reveled in the limelight. And it's important to remember that in those days, there were probably eight or ten major New York daily newspapers. And the Civil War had ended, depriving the papers of their blood and gore drama stuff from the war. And so they treated the events of Wall Street as a war. In fact, the fight for control of the Erie Railroad was called the Erie War, and it was reported as such. And Fisk made great copy. He was front page news in all of the newspapers, and he loved it. Now, one more piece of reputation for Fisk is the gold corner, the attempted gold corner of 1869. This has to do with the way gold was traded in those days, and it was bid in a pit in, in lower Manhattan. And Fisk was one morning the face of bidding up the gold because uh, his partners owned so much of it, Gould and Drew. And that came to ruin when the U.S. government, through Ulysses Grant, reversed and flooded the market with gold. But that made the mob even uh, not made the mob angry and they chased and everybody was upset with all their losses, but it made Fisk even more famous. Is that fair, Professor? Oh, there's no question about it. Cornering gold was the holy grail of speculation during the Gilded Age. Who could corner the gold market would almost literally have the American economy, the American financial system by the throat and could dictate the value of the dollar, could dictate who would pay whom and how much. And Fisk and Gould hatched this scheme that came within a whisker right. of success. Fisk was the public face of this. Gould was the brains behind the scenes. And so when the gold corner almost succeeded, and then when it spectacularly failed, Fisk was the one that everybody knew about. And Congress conducted investigations. And Fisk was quite happy to come and testify. And as he explained at the end in testimony to Congress, he said, it was a disaster. At the end, it was every man drag out his own corpse. He was amazingly blithe about all this. He seemed, he almost certainly suffered severe losses, but he figured it was you win some, you lose some. The book is The Murder of Jim Fisk for the Love of Josie Mansfield. H.W. Brands is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.
I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. A delightful story that's true. Can't make it up. We're talking about the biggest event in Wall Street at the beginning after the Civil War, uh, causing what eventually becomes a panic that rips the nation apart in 1873. This is during the Grant administration. Lots of scandal, lots of partisan battling. But we're concentrating on a love story that goes wrong. Professor, in, uh, in, in a way that you can't make up, Mr. Fisk introduces uh, Josie, his mistress, to a much younger man, a much slimmer man, a much more attractive man, Mr. Stokes. Who is he? Ned Stokes is a part-time associate of Fisk, someone who was the younger son of a family that at one point had been wealthy but was no longer quite so wealthy, who had to go to work, who found himself in the den of thieves that was Wall Street speculation at the time and was a little bit under-equipped to deal with them. But nonetheless, Fisk brought him on board, in part because he brought some money, in part because probably Fisk saw him as a relatively pliable character. But then Fisk decides to introduce Ned Stokes to Josie Mansfield. Well, Ned Stokes was everything Jim Fisk was not. Jim Fisk was a roly-poly character. He was not especially attractive. He was kind of over the top. Uh, he was he was a sugar daddy, but he wasn't someone who made a young woman's heart go flutter, flutter the way and Ned Stokes did. Ned Stokes was darkly handsome. And Ned then, Stokes looked dangerous. Ned Stokes was exactly the kind of person that Josie Mansfield once – she had control of money once she had financial security, decided was far preferable to Jim Fisk. And then Josie started to think, and the thinking was that Jim Fisk had always told her he was trading on her account, and she had $25,000 built up. So Josie brilliantly decides to write Jim a letter, a Dear John letter, I want my money. And Fisk, uh, uh, when Fisk gets this letter, he realizes that he's been uh, cornered out, he's been elbowed out. And Stokes and Josie are now left in a position where they have to shake the money out of him. They think of blackmail. What geniuses. But Fisk, because he has no fear of courts, is ready to fight this out in court. And it goes to trial in November of 71. What are the terms, Professor? Well, Fisk managed to get Stokes and Josie. In di First, he brings a civil suit against them to get an injunction to prevent the publication of the letters. They, Josie has cleverly, saved Fisk's love letters. And she knows that Fisk might be embarrassed if these see the light of day. There's another angle to this, and which makes it of much greater interest to New Yorkers, and that is the fact that Boss Tweed, William Tweed, the kingpin of Tammany Hall, was a close friend and associate of Jim Fisk. And he used to hang out with Fisk when Josie was present. And the people, the newspapers who were bidding for the letters we're under the impression, and Josie and Stokes let the impression grow, that there was information that was damaging not simply to Fisk, embarrassing to Fisk, but politically damaging, perhaps legally damaging, to Boss Tweed. And so it becomes clear that not only does Fisk not want the letters to come out, Tweed does not want the letters to come out. In those days, justice, or what passed for justice, was for sale in New York, and many of the judges owed their positions to Tammany Hall. And so Fisk was able to get a friendly hearing in the courts so that Josie and Stokes found themselves legally overmatched to the point where Fisk managed to get a criminal indictment drawn against Ned Stokes for blackmail. And when this happened, Stokes became outraged. He realized he was in over his head, and he discovered, he decided, there was but one way out. And that way out is January 1872, and the way the professor tells it, I read it this way. There's only one determination. It's cold-blooded murder. He takes a pistol. He goes to uh, a Fisk, a Fisk's hotel. He spots him from a staircase, and he shoots him twice. And uh, they're witnesses, and he's captured, correct? That's right. Okay. All true. Uh, the, the twist is, well, here's the twist. Okay. Stokes is taken to the jail, to the tombs, while Fisk Clay is dying. And they even have Fisk confess, to, I mean, remark at the end on the deathbed that uh, Mr. Stokes killed me. Everybody's sort of hanging over this, including all the newspapers. However, uh, Stokes feels, uh, what, vindicated that the, the mob will release him? I don't quite know. What is his state of mind in the tombs? Well, he understands that just because you shoot somebody in cold blood in broad daylight doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be convicted for murder. This happened in New York. There's a delightful moment, delightful from the standpoint of the historian, where Fisk is lying in his blood, dying in the hotel. And 
the legal authorities bring Stokes before him so that Fisk can identify him as the one who shot him. But there is a twist of the legal system in those days that gives a special credibility to deathbed testimony. Mm. Because if you're dying and about to meet your maker, you certainly will not lie. But it requires the speaker to believe that he's dying. And so the, the legal authority who brings Stokes in wants to get Fisk to say he realizes he's dying. So he says, do you think you're dying? And Fisk says, I don't want to die. I hope I'm not dying. But the sheriff wants him to say, yes, I'm dying, because then it will render his testimony that much more persuasive. But he does identify Stokes as his assailant, and Stokes is brought up on a charge of murder. The trial begins, and the first trial is in front of the whole world, but New York City and all those uh, courts. And the testimony is pretty straightforward from what we're looking at, except for the twist. The twist is Stokes thinks he's innocent in some fashion or shouldn't be found guilty, and he finds everybody at fault. Uh, Josie's quite standing back from this because her lover's on trial for killing Jim Fisk. Uh, The verdict comes in, and it totally surprised me, Professor, because I was expecting him to be not guilty. They found him guilty very quickly, completely guilty of first-degree murder. Mm -hmm. And there's the twist that's coming. The uh, The court's decision is overturned. Why? It's overturned because the judge apparently, or at least the judge decided, uh, an appeals court judge, decided that the jury was wrongly charged, was misinformed about the law. Now, from this distance, it's really difficult to tell whether the appeals judge was on the take because it's quite clear that both sides were doing their best to push the outcome in their own direction. And it became almost a matter of who got to the judge last. And so um, Stokes thinks he's going to hang, and, but then he's released at the last minute, and they have to have a new trial. And they have a new trial, and eventually he is convicted not of murder but of manslaughter. So he will not be executed. He will simply go to Sing Sing, and off he goes to Sing Sing. And by this time, Stokes, the dashing, handsome young guy, is but a shadow of his former self. He spent a lot of time in jail cells, although in those days, if you were wealthy, you could order in food from Delmonico's. You could furnish your jail cell. So the rich in jail live differently than the poor in jail, as they did on the outside. Stokes goes off to Sing Sing, and within relatively a a short amount of time, he reports that his health is failing badly. In fact, he might die in prison. For something for which it wasn't, he wasn't uh, convicted of a capital crime. He was only supposed to be in there for several years. And so he manages to get released on account of poor health. He gets out of prison, and wouldn't you know it, he makes a miraculous recovery. The light and the fresh air, and he's almost a new man. The murder of Jim Fisk for the love of Josie Mansfield, who lives another 60 years, A Tragedy of the Gilded Age by H.W. Brands. I'm John Batchelor. This-